So module two is all about alignment and visualization of alignments. Uh, and actually what's being shown here in this picture that's getting reused for each title slide is sort of a, uh, a cartoon representation of reads. Uh, in this case, they're single end reads that are being aligned against an mRNA uh, where the exons have already been spliced together and the introns removed. Um, but really what we're going to be doing is aligning against the genome and then uh, inferring what that thing looks like. Uh, just to review again our uh, learning objectives for the course, we're now in Module 2, uh, Alignment and Visualization. So we've already done our intro to the RNA sequencing and our input data, and now we're going to take our uh, input data and talk about aligning it and visualizing the alignments themselves. For this objective, or for this module in particular, the objectives are to discuss some of the alignment challenges and common questions again. We'll talk about some different alignment strategies. <coughs> We'll do a brief introduction to bow tie and top hat itself, which is the aligner that we're going to spend most of our time using. Uh, and then, unfortunately, we're going to spend some time uh, going over the BAM and BED formats. And I'll warn you in advance that the BAM format in particular is very esoteric. Uh, and I didn't invent it, so don't uh, shoot the messenger. Uh, but you're really stuck with these files. They're very, very ubiquitous in next generation sequence analysis. So. You might as well just uh, get used to that and try to uh, understand them the best as we can. Uh, we're going to visualize some of our alignments using a, a genome browser called the Integrated Genome Viewer, uh, which is published by the Broad Institute. And it's by far the most popular uh, genome viewer for next-gen sequence data. But there are uh, multiple alternatives, and we'll <coughs> provide resources to help you find some of those alternatives. Sometimes there might be one that's better for a particular application, or there might be something about it that you like. Uh, and then we're going to briefly uh, introduce this concept of BAM read counting. Uh, in particular, we're going to use it as, as a, uh, a way to determine uh, variant allele expression status. This is really when you want to dig into your alignments and find out at, at a particular position, is there a mutation or a common polymorphism uh, that's being expressed, and what does that expression look like? <coughs> So some of the challenges of RNA-seq alignment, specifically, uh, probably the, the easiest one to understand is computational cost, uh, because we're starting with hundreds of millions of reads covering the transcriptome, and all of them have to be placed uh, onto the genome to try to understand what transcript they might have come from. Uh, there's a, a pretty high computational cost associated with that. Uh, it's common for anyone analyzing any serious amount of RNA-seq data to want to use a cluster, or perhaps uh, in our case we're going to use the cloud where we have some access to uh, hefty computers, and if we had lots of data we could easily fire up many instances on the cloud to churn through large amounts of data all at once as long as we're willing to pay for it. <coughs> I've already alluded to this. Uh, alignments in RNA in particular are complicated by the fact that the alignment can be spliced, so a particular read can span across two exons, with a big intervening intron sequence in between. So the aligner has to uh, often divide the read into pieces and figure out exactly where those boundaries are. And sometimes there's a big search space to look, uh, to look in, because it, introns, particularly in uh, species like human, can be very large. <coughs> uh, this is a common question that, that gets asked uh, about alignment uh, with all of these different aligners out there, can I just align my data once using one approach and be done with it once and for all? Uh, and the, uh, unfortunately, the answer is probably not. Uh, there are certain alignment strategies that are more suited to certain downstream uh, applications. So for example, when you're doing expression analysis, you might want to optimally align a certain way. Uh, when you're aligning to find uh, RNA fusions, you may need to align in a different way. Uh, and it's just a very difficult problem to, to create one alignment that is equally good for, for all purposes. So unfortunately, we have, to we have to spend this computational cost sometimes multiple times if we're analyzing the data in many contexts. <coughs> and sort of a, uh, a follow-on to that, is Top Hat the only mapper to consider for RNA-seq data? Uh, and the answer is, of, co of course, no. There are many uh, aligners. Uh, and on your own time, you can check out this BioStars question where this, this uh, question has been discussed in some detail. And different people uh, pipe in with what aligners they like and uh, for which application. So you can uh, skip having to do those evaluations yourself and just learn from what the community has already learned about how different aligners behave in different contexts. So there's a variety of ways of thinking about the RNA-seq uh, mapping strategies that people employ. Uh, I like this particular depiction because it's fairly straightforward. Uh, it's just taken from a, a review article in Nature Methods a couple years ago uh, by Sean Grimmond and Nicole Clunan. 
Um, there's sort of three strategies that we'll sometimes talk about. Uh, the first is de novo assembly. So this isn't really alignment per se. This is where you're just taking your reads and you, you don't even think about a reference genome at first. All you're doing is you're looking at your reads and you're trying to identify reads that have similarity to each other and you're piece building uh, a consensus out of them. So figuring out which reads look like they came from the same sequences that have overlapping uh, homologous regions uh, and building up a basically a contic where you've assembled all of these reads into a larger piece. So you're starting with 100 MERS and you might as assemble a contig that's thousands of bases long uh, and hopefully that corresponds to a transcript. And then once you've uh, created that contig, you can map that whole thing back to a reference genome if you have a reference genome. Uh, if you don't have a reference genome, then <coughs> you would just do some other downstream analysis. So you might skip right to uh, analyzing those sequences for evidence of open reading frames to try to understand what proteins might be uh, translated from that RNA sequence. So this is a common strategy that people will use if they don't have a reference genome or perhaps if uh, they're looking for really novel structures where relying on a reference genome might bias what you're finding. Uh, another strategy uh, is to align to the transcriptome. Uh, directly, so where you have reads and instead of aligning to the genome and then figuring out what transcripts uh, are annotated in that part of the genome, you just align directly to transcript sequences. So this is a much short, smaller search space. So for example, in the human, uh, only about 1 to 2 percent of all bases correspond to the transcriptome. So you can collapse that down to just the transcript sequences with the introns already removed and just start aligning your reads directly to transcripts. <coughs> the disadvantage of this approach is that uh, it relies on what you already know about the transcriptome. So you're biasing your result to some degree uh, towards the known transcripts um, and you may miss things, you may miss novel isoforms, you may miss novel fusions, you may not even notice that there's novel genes there uh, and so forth. So there, the strategy that really the community has settled on as the most common is aligning to the reference genome. And this can only be done if you're if your reads are sufficiently long that they'll allow you to do these spliced alignments, uh, which is what's depicted in these three, where you've got enough sequence on either end to anchor uh, on one exon and then to figure out where the intron uh, boundaries are and, and where the next exon continues on. So this is the strategy that we're going to use, uh, and we'll just talk about the other ones a little bit. Uh, so I think I basically covered all of this uh, while describing the last slide, but basically the sort of three use cases are you're going to do a de novo assembly if you don't have a reference genome. Uh, if you're looking for complex variation that might be missed by relying on the structure of the reference genome. So for example, in the human genome, we know that there are regions uh, that occur in some humans that are not currently represented in the human reference genome, uh, just because of the people that happen to have been selected for the human sequencing of the human reference genome project. So if you want a really unbiased uh, view of, of a particular transcriptome, you might be worried that the corresponding part of the genome where your transcript is coming from isn't even in the reference. Uh, so you might want to start with a de novo assembly uh, for that reason. Uh, you would align to the transcriptome. Mostly people do this if they have very short reads where they're not able to do spliced alignments. And then you'd align to the reference genome uh, in basically all other scenarios. And each of these has sort of a different suite of tools. Uh, that uh, goes along with each strategy. If you're, let's say, using RNA seq for a very uh, small, small use, just for gene expression uh, analysis, could you then uh, use just the transcriptome and not reverse? Uh, you can, and some people uh, do that. It's um, not as computationally expensive. Um, and if you're really, if you're confident that your transcriptome is fairly uh, complete, comprehensive, your view of, of, so for human, for example, has a very well annotated transcriptome. Uh, it's, you know, all of the major genes have been found by now after decades of, of working on it. Um, and it's a lot easier to align to than the genome. But there are some uh, analytical concerns. So one of the challenges with that strategy is that how to handle alternative transcripts from the same gene. So a particular gene may have 10 transcripts uh, that use slightly different combinations of exons or have different uh, three prime start sites or polyadenylation sites. Uh, and then when you align to all of those things together, 
you have this issue that you have reads aligning equally, equally well to multiple transcripts, and there's sort of a counting problem that how do you decide which transcript each read came from. If you're doing just totally the gene level analysis, you can just collapse everything down to the, basically the exon content of each gene, uh, and you can align against that. You just have to think about basically how you create your database of transcripts before you do this strategy. But it can be a quick and simple way to get gene expression estimates. <coughs> as long as you're willing to accept all of the caveats. So we typically get that 50 basic entities. So which method sample? 50 is right on the cusp. You'll definitely be able to use the strat the, the tutorial that we're doing will work just fine. Um, you will probably not get as good results with respect to uh, transcript discovery and alternative splicing just because 50 base reads are a little bit on the short side of things. Uh, really, they, re they recommend more than 50 and really more than 75 before you start to really trust the, the junction mappings, so reads that span across junctions. But you can still get good gene expression estimates and you can run the tools exactly the same way. It will automatically detect that your reads are shorter and it will try to do the best that it can. It's one of the nice things about this top hat suite that, that we're using is that uh, a lot of uh, the tweaks to the way things are done are actually built into the tool. It basically examines your data and tries to do what it thinks is best based on the data that you give it. Maybe it's both. <coughs> so, um, like paired versus single end still? So you go over, everyone's moving to paired, but mm -hmm. you can just twice the amount of single end sequencing. And is it that, so what your question is, should you do that? Yeah, is it as good? So there's a number of reasons people tend to rec recommend paired reasons. Uh, one is just practical because that's what most people are doing. So a lot of people are designing tools with paired end reads in mind. Uh, another is that having the pairing information allows you to do some very simple, uh, take some very relatively simple approaches for finding gene fusions. At least they're conceptually simple. Uh, so if you want to find fusion genes, and this is a big interest for cancer researchers, you can look for cases where one read maps to one chromosome and the other read maps to the other chromosome. It's this sort of very simple concept. Uh, and having the paired reads allows you to do that. You also improve mapping efficiency substantially by having paired reads. So you have uh, twice as much information, more than twice as much information, because instead of having uh, 100 mer, you have 200 mers. And you also have a prior expectation as to how far uh, apart they should be. And all of that information allows you to increase the the probability that you've placed it in the ge genome properly when you're mapping it. As for the difference between uh, two paired 100 mers and one single 200 mer, um, depending on exactly what those lengths are, like is it 250 versus one 100, or you'd have to really probably do some experiments to figure out like what the trade-offs are. Um, I think in certain circumstances for say splicing analysis, if you can get a nice long read, even if it's a single end, that might be really advantageous. It might, it might be better than a paired end read that was shorter. Um, and it just depends. Uh, thankfully, this, uh, the tutorial we're going to go through requires fairly mo uh, mild modifications to work on single end uh, data versus paired end data. And it will definitely work for, a, a lot of it will work for either paired end or single end, I think. Mm -hmm. The fusion detection will not work, though. Although there is no reason why you can't detect fusions with single-end reads if they're long enough. It just requires a different strategy and different tools. <clears throat> yeah, you might have to. You might have to make your own strategy, which will be potentially quite complicated. I mean. And it's not that no one has done this before. People used to do fusion detection with ESTs, for example, which were much longer, um, and they were single end. Okay. Okay. So I mentioned that there are lots of aligners, and there really, really are a lot. So this is a a, a summary created by uh, someone at EBI uh, that's placed it on a timeline from 2001 to 2013. Uh, and each of these is the name of a different aligner. Many of these developed by different groups all over the world. Uh, and there's more coming out all the time. This, uh, this hasn't stopped. This just continues on. 
Uh, they're color-coded according to the kind of data that they're expecting as input. Uh, so the RNA is red, uh, bisulfite aligners pink, blue is DNA. So you can see that there's a bias towards DNA. There's been a lot of DNA aligners created, uh, and then a few for microRNA. Uh, the one that we are going to use, so here's Top Hat here. Uh, did they put Top Hat 2 separately? It looks like uh, it doesn't have Top Hat 2 yet. Uh, another one that we're going to compare to is Star. Uh, so that's one of the more recent ones. Um, you could spend a lot of time evaluating these aligners. Again, I would uh, urge you to, to, to not, probably not spend your time evaluating aligners until you've uh, searched around for other people that have done so. So for example, the, the, there's a paper that corresponds to this figure and you can go read all about uh, aligners. Uh, and there's a bunch of information on the wiki and in Biostars about uh, different aligners that you might want to try for different applications. <coughs> so I mentioned this briefly, should I use a splice aware or unspliced mapper? Uh, as I've been saying, RNA-seq reads span uh, uh, large introns in some cases, uh, and the fragments being sequenced in RNA-seq represent uh, messenger RNAs, and they're there, therefore the introns are removed. So when we're aligning these reads back to the genome, we have to account for the, the introns that are uh, going to need to be basically spliced out of the alignment. Um, and generally, unless your reads are short, so I would say less than 50. Definitely if they're like in the 30 to 40 range, you're probably not going to want to use a splice aware aligner. It's just not going to work that well. Uh, if they're greater than 50, then you can go to these aligners like we're going to use Top Hat, Star, Map Splice, and so on. So this is just a high level description of how the Bowtie Top Hat aligner works. Uh, so really this aligner is uh, kind of two blocks of code. Uh, one is the original Bowtie or Bowtie, Bowtie 1 or Bowtie 2 aligner, uh, which was originally designed for DNA. Uh, and then Top Hat is kind of a layer on top of that that repurposes some of the functionality of Bowtie for uh, doing spliced alignments of RNA-seq data to the genome. And basically what it's doing is breaking reads into pieces and aligning those with Bowtie against the genome. Uh, and then it's interrogating all of those mini alignments uh, and trying to piece together what the spliced alignment actually looks like. And that's what the top hat layer does. It basically piles on top of bow tie. So it's starting by mapping all these little pieces of reads against the genome. Uh, it looks for islands, tries to define the edges of exons. Uh, as it gathers this information, it tries to figure out what the splice sites uh, that the reads are corresponding to might look like. Uh, and it considers the in, uh, information for uh, your species, so it tries to identify reads that span across uh, exon exon boundaries that look like what exon exon boundaries should look like. Uh, and it pieces all of this information together uh, to resolve exon edges and you get your splice junctions. Uh, and then Cufflinks is going to come along and use that information to try to assemble transcripts out of the alignments. So some of the common questions that come up uh, when doing these alignments. Should I allow multi-mapped reads is a common question. Uh, and basically a multi-mapped read is a read that can be placed uh, in multiple places in the genome, uh, either equally well or almost equally well. So there are many regions in the genome that are similar to each other. So for example, gene families, you may have an uh, olfactory gene, you may have 10 olfactory genes that share a lot of sequence identity, uh, and there are going to be parts of those where 100 mer is actually identical or nearly identical in one gene as it is in another gene. So when you uh, do your alignment of all your RNA-seq reads against the genome, some subset of reads can't be assigned unambiguously to one single spot. They could go equally well to two or three or 10 or 100 or 1,000 spots in some cases. In particular, reads that correspond to repeat elements in the genome could map many, many, many places. Uh, in DNA alignment, uh, probably the most common strategy is to randomly choose one of those sites. So the most commonly used uh, aligner for DNA reads is BW, uh, BWA, uh, and it will take all of those uh, possible equally good alignments and it just picks one randomly. And it assumes that if you sequence deeply enough and you have even coverage that you'll kind of just get an even representation uh, and it'll basically all come out in the wash. Uh, for some other applications, in particular in particularly certain RNA-seq applications, you don't want to do that. You want to maintain some level of that multi-mapped information. 
uh, because some of the tools make take advantage of that. So Top Hat is going to allow reads to map multiple places if they go multiple places equally well. Uh, and then the downstream tools are going to use that information uh, as a measure of uncertainty uh, as to the placement of those reads, and they're and it's going to weight that information according to how much multi-mapping occurred. And it's basically going to do that by saying if this read could go uh, one of ten places, instead of giving each of those places a count of one, I'm going to give each of those places a count of 0.1. Um, and that's going to uh, affect your expression estimates. And there's been some papers that show that with Top Hat uh, and Cufflinks, the, the tool we're going to use to generate expression estimates, you lose information if you don't allow multi-mapped reads. And actually, the more uh, multi-mapped information you include, the better the statistical model that Cufflinks uses, uh, the better it works. So you, you get more accurate expression estimates uh, if, you, if you allow multi-mapped multi alignments in your alignment file. Um, it doesn't actually, so in the, for multi-map reads in particular, you actually have to set a, uh, a threshold. So a, a number, a, an integer. So basically by default it allows up to 20 uh, alignments for a single read and it stores that information in the alignment file so that you, it, downstream programs know whether each alignment is unique or whether uh, there are many uh, equally good alignments. But it won't tell you that Yeah. You don't know if any of them are correct. They're, and Top Hat is not, one of the weaknesses of Top Hat is that it doesn't really have a great uh, score, mapping quality score. The information encoded in it, there is a, a, a mapping quality score field, but it's not really known for being very useful. Um, not in the sense that uh, BWA is, I would say. Yeah. Uh, there is a way to access that information uh, by pulling up the detailed read information for an alignment. It should tell you uh, whether the alignment is primary or secondary. I don't know if it tells you if you can view in the viewer how many alignments there are. It's something that we would have to check. The, the BAM specification document will explain how to encode multi-mapping. And I think there's a tag that tells you how many multi-mappings were observed for a particular read. But I, I'm not sure if we can actually get at that information in IGB. That's something that we can look into, though. Do you know if um, the star and top hat, do they, do they work with multi-map reads in the same manner? Or... Hmm. Good question. Because it, it's a completely different algorithm for alignment. Right? It is. Um, and they do, I mean, they have the, down, the tools downstream of Top Hat in mind for STAR. So they have, they have recommended running guidelines to produce output that can be fed into Cufflinks so that you can use STAR alignments instead of Top Hat. And it, does, it definitely does allow multi-mapped reads. But I'm not sure if the default behavior is the same, if they're represented the same way in the BAM file or not. Um, but we're going to generate, we're going to generate uh, star and top hat alignments on the same data, so we can take a look at that. So if you read the star paper, it says it's better than top hat. If you read the top hat paper, it says it's better than star at, at doing things like this. <laughs> I, it's difficult to, I, mean, I have it systematically, I mean, star is quite recent, so we have only started using it quite recently, so that the stuff that you're doing in this tutorial is, is fairly cutting edge in that regard. Um, uh, the only anecdote that I can really give, other than the two papers claims, of course they claim their own greatness. Uh, uh, I saw a poster at AGBT this spring uh, where an author of another aligner, I think Rum, 
uh, had done an evaluation, his own independent evaluation of Star, Top Hat, and like five or six other RNA seq aligners. And even though he was the author of a third aligner, he said Star was the best. So that was fairly telling, I thought. Um, but I think it will probably be context dependent to some degree. I doubt that there's going to be an easy answer. What does seem clear is that you get very similar alignments in a much shorter amount of time than Top Hat. So it's definitely faster at the expense of using much more memory. So you consume 10 times as much RAM, but you get your alignments up to 10 times faster, and the alignments themselves appear very similar. And we're going to do some comparisons of the output expression values and things from both, and you'll see that they're quite comparable. Uh, there's sort of different strategies. Um, it's fairly common it, when using cufflinks to provide a list of genes in the form of a GTF file that you want to disregard when it comes to expression estimation, and we, we do that at WashU, um, and that would include not just pseudogenes, but uh, ribosomal and mitochondrial genes as well. Uh, but it all depends on how how much you want to limit your output to particular genes versus sort of taking a, a global picture. Okay, so now we're going to get into the output, sort of the, the nitty-gritty details of what the output of these liners looks like. You're going to hear these words a lot, SAM and BAM. Uh, so really what you get out of these aligners, almost all aligners uh, use this format now, the SAM fo uh, format, which stands for Sequence Alignment Map Format. BAM is this basically the same thing. It's just a compressed version of the SAM file. Uh, so keep in mind that when you have a BAM file, you can't just view it in a text viewer. I mean, these files are going to be massive. Don't ever try to just open them in WordPad or something. Um, you'll be disappointed with the outcome. But there's lots of tools for handling the, the compressed uh, versions of them. Uh, it's common to need to convert between SAM and BAM because some tools support the compressed version, some tools don't. Uh, if you want to learn about that, I've posted a, a useful Biostar uh, posting all about that topic. But for now, let's just get straight into looking at the file format themselves. Uh, this is not to actually read. This is just to give you a, a quick taste of what we're going to be getting into. Uh, and it's basically a, a screenshot of a SAM file. Uh, what I'm showing here is just the header of the file, uh, which has various uh, entries describing uh, the sequences, the reads were aligned to, uh, and so forth, and then the alignment section. So each SAM file has a, a header section that explains details about the file, and then the main body of the file is the alignment section that contains the actual alignments, uh, and they're uh, stored in this very crazy looking format. Uh, and you can't really read it here, but we're going to uh, look at uh, the pieces of those alignment sections in much more detail. So if you want to read all about the specification, every time you want to know some really nitty-gritty detail about what the abbreviations, et cetera, in these files are, you can look up the specifications. Uh, so it's a document devoted entirely to explaining what these files are all about. Uh, as I said, it consists of two sections. You've got a header section. This describes the source of the data, the reference sequence that you align to, the method of alignment is stored there. Uh, and so, so forth. So you can, if you get data from somewhere, someone else that's already been aligned, you can learn a lot about where that data came from, what the data uh, type is, and how it was aligned, uh, just by examining the header. Uh, and then there's the alignment section. So this is used to describe uh, the reads, the quality of the read, the way that a read uh, aligns to a region of the genome, and so forth, if there's any variance in the read relative to the genome, and so on. Um, as I said, BAM is a compressed version of SAM. The compressed uh, compression is lossless uh, BGZF format. That means uh, when you compress it, you save a lot of space. Uh, when you decompress it, you have all of the information that you had when you started with. Uh, there is no information loss at all, as there is with, say, an MP3 file uh, that is compressed audio file. Uh, but there are other BAM compression strategies that aren't necessarily lossless. Uh, so, for example, this is a whole field of research trying to make these files more efficient by compressing them and sacrificing some information in order to reduce the file size. <clears throat> a lot of things uh, 
computational tasks dealing with these files are not limited by how fast your CPU are. They're limited by how, how quickly you can read and write disk just because of the massive size of these files. So there's a lot of interest in can we reduce the size of the file without uh, sacrificing the information that's there uh, very much. Uh, just with our, like with our reference uh, genome file, we usually index these files because they're so big we want to create an index that helps us uh, find things in these massive files without having to scan through the file from beginning to end every time. Uh, and this allows us to rapidly retrieve, retrieve uh, alignments that overlap a specified region, for example, without going through the whole file. Uh, in order to do this indexing, you have to first sort the BAM, um, and the sorting is done uh, according to the position of the alignments. And I'm going to talk more about BAM sorting in a bit. So the header section, just to give a few more details, uh, as I said, it's used to describe the source of the data, the reference sequence, and the method of alignment. Uh, each section begins with a little at symbol. Uh, there's a header line that tells you uh, things about the sorting order of the alignments. There's a reference sequence dictionary that describes all of the sequences that you're aligning to. So usually these are the chromosomes of your genome that you've aligned all of your reads to. Uh, there's read group information. So you may have reads that belong to uh, different samples that have been mixed together or different libraries from the same sample or that were aligned with different parameters or so forth basically just a way of identifying subgroups of reads within the file. Uh, and then there's a PG section that describes uh, the program that was used to do the alignments. <clears throat> the alignment section itself uh, consists of uh, 11 basic fields, uh, starting with the uh, query template name, uh, there's flag, a reference name, and so on. Uh, we're going to look at some of these in detail, so I won't spend a lot of time on this, but the most important piece of information, basically, you have a read name, uh, you have some flags that describe the alignments, we're going to talk about those in detail. The reference sequence is like chromosome 1, chromosome 2. Uh, the position is the position on that chromosome, so it aligned at position 1,520,000 of chromosome 1, uh, and that will be of read 1 of a read pair. There's a mapping quality value, and how useful this is will depend on which aligner you used. A cigar string uh, describes the nature of the alignment, and we're going to talk about those in detail on a separate slide. Uh, and then there's information about the mate if you've got paired end reads, uh, the length uh, if you've got paired end reads, what the length of your fragment was likely to be, uh, and then you've got the actual sequence of the read and the quality of the read. So basically, all of the information about the read itself is still maintained in this, in this file. So it's not just the alignments, but it actually contains the raw read sequence data. And for that reason, some people are actually stopping using FASTQ files at all, and they're just actually storing all of their read information in BAM format, even if their, alignment, even if their alignments are not there. So you can have an alignment file, a BAM file that contains reads that actually has no alignments in it, but it, can, it follows the format of the BAM file specification. Uh, and that allows it to be compressed and it just be, this has just become a currency for moving and sharing uh, read data as well as alignments. So many aligners will actually take a BAM file as input and spit out a BAM file as output. Uh, and then what I'm showing here is just example values for each of these fields. Uh, so here's a, a read of that name, uh, the flags, I'll have to explain that separately, it's quite uh, confusing. Uh, it aligned to chromosome 1 at position uh, 11,623 with a mapping quality of 300. The cigar string is 100M. I'll explain what that means. Uh, this equal sign means that both pairs mapped to the same chromosome. Uh, and the second read, as you can see, mapped just a little bit further downstream. Uh, this tells us that our fragment, so the distance from the beginning and end of read 1 and read 2, is about 220 bases. And then we've got the sequence and the quality string. Okay, so what are these flags all about? Uh, the best way to get your, uh, wrap your head around understanding these flags is actually to visit this website. Uh, you can actually search for uh, BAM flags explained or SAM flags explained, and you'll get, uh, usually this will be the top hit if you Google for that. Basically, there's 11 flags that describe the alignment, uh, various features of the alignment. Uh, and at each of these positions, a value of 1 indicates that the flag is set or that thing is true, and a value of 0 indicates that it's not true. Uh, and then you can take all combinations of zeros and 1s in these things, and you can represent them as one number uh, from 0 to 2047, 
or 2 to the 11, two to the 11 minus 1. So it's a binary uh, format for storing a, a number. Uh, and these flags are used uh, on every line in the BAM SAM file. And then when you're viewing these files, you can filter, you can require that certain flags be set, or you can filter out uh, alignments that have certain flags that are set. And this can allow you to identify reads that meet certain criteria. So for example, you might uh, want to grab all of the reads in your BAM file that are unmapped for some reason. Uh, and you can do that by specifying the flag that would correspond to segment equals unmapped. And we're going to do a demonstration of how to go through uh, that uh, and how to use this website as well in the tutorial. Okay, so the other thing that requires extra explanation is these cigar strings. Um, I showed an example that was 100M. Uh, so you have 100 mer, and the cigar string was 100M. That basically means that there were 100 bases that, I, that were either matches or mismatches, but it's basically one contiguous alignment of 100 bases. Uh, a cigar string is basically uh, a way of explaining uh, deviations from a simple alignment. So uh, if there are insertions uh, or deletions or uh, there's an intron, uh, it's sort of a compact format for uh, allowing you to represent what that alignment looks like in a simple string. So what this says is that there were 81 bases that uh, are aligning as a match to the <coughs> genome, and then there's 859 with an N, N means skipped, so there's a 859 skipped, and then the alignment continues on for another 19 bases. So really what this means is that there's 81 bases matching, probably to the edge of an exon, and then there's an intron of 859 bases, and then the last 19 bases of the alignment continue on. So this is one of those spliced alignments that we've seen in some of the uh, cartoon depictions. Uh, and these can get very hairy when there's uh, insertions or deletions relative to the reference. Uh, all of that can be described in a cigar string, and they, and they can get very long, and there are many tools that parse these things and, and use the information in them to, to do various things. Sorry, what's the difference between an alignment match and a sequence match? Uh, it basically is trying to clarify that a sequence can align. So say I have 50 bases and they align to a region in the genome. Uh, the actual sequence might be slightly different. So in the middle of that, the reference might be a T, but my read might have a G. So there's actually a mismatch there. So the M actually means match or mismatch. But there's 50 bases, and the alignment is 50 bases long. There's no insertions or deletions. It's just that one of those bases differs from what we expect. And that is the cause of great confu dis like confusion with this, uh, these cigar strings, particularly when people are looking for uh, mutations or variants. Um, because you think 100M, that must be match, which means all of the sequences much, must match. But it doesn't mean that. They can be mismatches. <sighs> OK, so one additional file format that we uh, need to know something about, and thankfully this is a much simpler file format, uh, is the bed format. So the reason why, uh, we're introducing that is that when we're working with BAM files, it's very common to want to examine a focused subset of the reference genome. So for example, we want to look at the exons of our favorite gene, EGFR, uh, and we want to pull out information from the BAM file for just those exons. Uh, a good way to do that is to create a bed file that represents the coordinates of those exons. The format is explained here. Um, and then there's all these BAM manipulation tools that will uh, accept a, a file uh, regions of interest in bed format that will allow us to basically pull up information just for those regions. Uh, the basic format of this is very simple. So you just have chromosome name, uh, like chromosome 1, and then start and end position. These are the coordinates of the start and end of the region you're interested in. Uh, the one thing to remember about bed format is that they're zero based, so the first base in the chromosome is zero, not one. Um, otherwise, it's fairly straightforward. There are a number of tools that are commonly used to manipulate SAM and BAM bed files, uh, and these are some of the most popular of these, and we're going to play around with a few of those, so I won't go into them in more detail now. Sorting, another common question. How should I sort my SAM BAM files? So you have all of these alignments, and they're generally not there in random order. As you go through the file, they're usually sorted according to the name 
uh, of the read or the position of the alignment. Uh, and you'll see sorting being done in those two ways depending on what you're doing. Uh, so generally they're sorted by position for performance because th uh, this allows us to like to scan through a BAM file quickly and find a, a location very rapidly. Uh, it allows us to identify duplicate alignments very efficiently and so forth. Uh, but certain tools require that the BAM be sorted by read name. And usually this is when we want to be able to easily identify both reads of a pair. So we want them to be close to each other in the file so that we can uh, look for uh, reads that might be involved in fusions. So for example, if one read of a read pair maps to chromosome 1 and one maps to chromosome 3, if there's, the file is sorted by position, those things will be very, very far apart. If we sort it by name, they come back to being right beside each other. Uh, and that's just a sort of uh, per, for computational per performance when we're scanning through these big files. Here's a visualization uh, in IGV of some RNA-seq data. So we're going to be looking, uh, we're going to be using this browser ourselves uh, and playing around with it, but this is just for reference and also just to give you a peek preview uh, of what some of the features of this browser are. So shown at the top here is an ideogram of a chromosome with the ba banding pattern. Uh, as you mouse over various regions uh, of the BAM file, information will pop up. Sometimes this can be annoying. Uh, this little button allows you to control that pop-up to toggle it on or off. Uh, this little red bar indicates where on the chromosome you're currently viewing the alignment. So we're looking at a very small region, just actually a single gene, uh, and that gene is located right there. Often that you have two sort of areas to each track. You have a pileup area and then an individual reads area. In the pileup area, it's basically a histogram where the higher uh, the gray bars, the more reads are piling up there. Uh, and then in this panel here, you're seeing individual reads being depicted uh, one by one. It's sometimes hard to see them because there's so many packed in together. Uh, here's some example of uh, single reads that are not spliced. So there's just basically aligning to a large uh, uh, exon. Uh, and then these reads here with the little uh, blue bars connecting them are examples of spliced reads. Uh, it, you can color the reads in different strat uh, modes, but in this mode, uh, reads that came from the positive strand are pink and those that came from the negative strand are blue. Uh, and this would only be relevant uh, information in a library where the strand information was maintained. So you remember we talked about library strategies where strand information is maintained and others where they're not. Uh, in a library that's unstranded, you will see just a mixture of uh, pink and blue reads scattered all over the place. They're approximately equal proportions. Uh, if the library is stranded, you'll see them all appearing to come from a single strand. Is this the capture? Because it's mostly PR being sequenced. Uh, this may actually be capture data, yeah. Yeah, that's a good observation. What are some of the darker uh, red reads? Some areas are more darker red Um, There may be... Uh, the coloring can represent different things. Sometimes it represents low quality bases or um, misalign uh, mismatching bases can be colored and uh, those will appear as like darker colors, different colors. Um, uh, at the bottom here we have a gene track. Um, this tiny little thing tells you the coverage scale so you want to pay attention to that scale sometimes to know how much depth is actually here. Uh, and I think that's everything. So I mentioned there were alternate viewers. Uh, there's a whole bunch of them. You can, this is just provided as reference if you want to try some of the others out. Uh, there's a couple Biostars questions there that maintain fairly a, a current lists of the alternatives. Uh, and then the last thing that I wanted to talk about was this idea of BAM read counting. Again, just as a primer to the tutorial. Um, what I'm showing here now is a really zoomed in view uh, in IGV of some reads uh, from an RNA-seq library uh, where each of these blue bars is an individual read uh, and we're looking at mm, say 50 base window of the genome. Uh, the reference genome bases are shown along the bottom here so it's C, C, A, A, G, C, G, G and so on. Uh, and then within the field where the reads are shown uh, by default the bases are not labeled unless they differ from the reference genome. So what's being shown here is you've got several reads that have a T, but the reference genome is a C at that position. 
uh, and some of them are labeled T, the others are not labeled, so those are the same as the reference genome. So basically you have a mixture of C's and T's being reported at, at this position, uh, and in this case what that is is actually a mutation. Uh, this is a tumor sample. This RNA came from a tumor. You have a mutant position in the genome. It's heterozygous, and that's why we're seeing approximately 50% uh, T bases and 50% reference bases. Uh, and then at the top here, you have this colored bar, which is hard to see, but it's sort of half blue, half red, uh, and that indicates that it, uh, it's about 50% count for one versus the other. In this case, you've got actually 12 reads versus out of 25, so you get uh, really close to 50% uh, variant to low frequency. So this is sort of a, an intuitive way of thinking about counting uh, the allele uh, observations for a particular position in a BAM file, but of course this would uh, not be practical to do at thousands of positions uh, in the genome, so we need a way to do this automatically. Uh, and BAM, BAM read count is a, a, a tool that we're going to use to do this kind of counting without having to look uh, in IGB at the, at the viewer. We're just going to extract this information automatically. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the tutorial. So again, I'm going to show this uh, summary. So we, uh, in the last section, we covered our input formats. Now we're going to cover sequencing, uh, uh, the sequence data, and specifically, we're really going to focus on this read alignment step uh, for module two. What is the uh, barcoded data? When do you separate them? Barcodes are usually separated very early, um, usually before you even have a fast cube file that this has already happened um, on the instruments even. Like the computer that's attached to the instrument will often do a demultiplex. Oh uh, yeah, no. Top hat will assume that your data has been demultiplexed already. Okay. And that is really a fundamental next gen sequencing type question um, that should be addressed by the software that gives you your data off the instrument. You really shouldn't have to handle that problem yourself. And okay. if you're downloading data from the internet or from a public repository, it's highly unlikely that we'll still have indexes. Usually that information is removed upstream. Okay. Okay, so again, we're just going to briefly go over what we're going to do in this tutorial. Uh, so really what we're going to do is run Bowtie Top Hat 2 uh, or star uh, with parameters suitable for gene expression analysis. Uh, we're going to use SAM tools to demonstrate the features of the SAM BAM format and basic manipulation of these alignment files. So we're going to do things like view, sort, index, and filter. Uh, we're going to use IGV to look at some RNA-seq alignments and view a variant position, just like that screenshot that I just showed you. Uh, we're going to determine BAM read counts at a variant position without having to look at, uh, to manually look in IGV. Uh, and we're going to try to understand these uh, flags and the quality of, uh, of BAM files by using uh, uh, these tools, FlagStat, SAMSTAT. Uh, we already did this fast QC, so we're not going to... Uh, maybe we do repeat it on alignments. Not sure. Okay, so this is basically what I just said. These are the sections in, this is the file that we're going to be working from. We're going to start by aligning reads with top hat. Uh, actually, this should say four libraries, not eight. Uh, we're going to Again, we're going to use Top Hat for the alignment. We're going to supply a GTF file that we obtained in our in the previous tutorial, uh, and then we're going to supply Bowtie with the index genome that we also uh, created in step four, and we're going to use this dot dash G option uh, to tell Top Hat to look for exon exon junctions of known transcripts, uh, and then on top of that, it's still going to search for novel exon exon junctions as well, so that we can potentially learn about alternative splicing. Uh, since there, again, this should say four, since there are four libraries in the test data set, four alignment commands are uh, run. Uh, we drop this from eight down to four just to make it go faster. Uh, and these alignments take a couple minutes each, so we'll, we'll be able to spend a few time watching them do their thing. Uh, we already talked about the output files that we're going to get. We're going to get some SAM and BAM files. 
And then we're going to repeat this process with star, which is conceptually very similar, but it's just an independent program. Uh, and we're going to compare the try to compare the runtime uh, to top hat uh, and any additional steps that were needed to do the alignments. Once we have alignments, we're going to visualize them. So we're going to create index versions of our BAM files uh, uh, because IGV needs these to, to allow us to view them efficiently. Uh, we might, we're going to try and visualize some spliced alignments. We'll look for some uh, X on X on junction supporting reads. Uh, we'll look at a couple examples of differentially expressed genes. We'll try to compare the top at and star alignments. Uh, and then we're going to try to find a few variant positions in our RNA-seq data. Uh, and then we're going to test a few tools to uh, create a pileup from BAM, the BAM file, and we'll explain what uh, a pileup uh, looks like. Uh, but it's basically a representation of what uh, bases were observed at a particular position. Yep. I'm wondering, do the non-coding RNAs get lost in this? Or? Um, no. They shouldn't be. I mean, if your library, if you created a library that allowed non-coding yeah. RNAs. Um, so just because there's Yeah, so that's a good question. The, the feature file will just be used as a guide. So it's going to, basically what Top Hat is going to do is going to first try to align reads to known transcripts. Uh, and then it's going to align to the junctions of exons from those transcripts. But reads that don't align to those things will still be uh, aligned to the whole genome. Uh, and they could correspond to completely novel genes, genes that weren't accurately representing your GTF. Uh, it's just uh, a little helping hand to make it, basically to make the alignment more efficient. Um, uh, this is another screenshot of the post-alignment visualization in IGV. In this case, we're showing two different samples. Uh, so we've got a tumor and a normal, I believe. Uh, and again, it's sort of the same features as what I showed before. Uh, we're going to use a variety of things to do a post-alignment QC. So we're going to use SAM tools view to see the format of the SAM BAM file. We're going to look at some flags, filter out some types of alignments. Uh, we're going to use SAM tools flag stat to get uh, sort of an overall summary of the alignments. Uh, and then we're going to run SAM stat on our tumor normal BAMs and re review the resulting report in our browser. Uh, and then we're going to use fast QC again this time to perform a, a QC of the actual alignment files instead of the fast Q files. Uh, here's an example of the post alignment QC output from SAMSTAT. Uh, I won't go into that because we're going to look at it uh, firsthand. Um, and that's it. I think we're ready to go uh, with the tutorial.